Lord God, thank you for okay. giving us this opportunity to study your word today. Send your Holy Spirit, bless us, that uh, uh, through this we okay. grow closer to you, we grow in our appreciation for who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Okay. All right, so um, in lesson one, of course, we talked about who, who God is. In uh, lesson two, we had um, went through, you know, sin and grace and the law and the gospel. You know, the message that in God's law, he tells us to be perfect and, and shows us that we've failed at that. But then he, the gospel, shows us our Savior. Um, Jesus came, lived the perfect life for us, and everyone who believes in him has eternal life. And so that's where the last page of lesson two deals with faith. You know, the, the truth that all sins have been paid for by Jesus is out there. Um, the truth that we all deserve punishment for our sins, both those truths are out there. How, how do they uh, benefit us? How do they apply to us? Well, that, that comes through faith as we believe this. In, in lesson four, we'll talk about that faith a little bit more. But, but right now, it's just talking about what is faith. Um, and in Romans 4 there, uh, you have Paul writing to these believers in Rome and kind of giving them an overview of how this whole relationship with God thing works. And uh, a lot of the a lot of the Roman uh, believers were uh, Jewish uh, background. And uh, the, the Jews felt like they were saved because of their heritage, right? They were descendants of Abraham and Abraham was, was God's chosen one. So since they're connected to him, they're, they're in, um, and and Paul makes the point that it wasn't it wasn't you know how good Abraham was or anything about him it was about God's gift it was about God doing this crediting and so so I'll read that passage there oh, Paul writes against all hope Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations just as it had been said to him so shall your offspring be you familiar with the story of Abraham uh not really. I mean, I am, but I'm not. Does yeah, that make yeah, sense? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a well-known name, but I mean, some of the details aren't always all that well-known, you know. So um, Abraham, God God came to Abraham and said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Uh, you're going to have all these descendants, and one of those descendants is going to be the the Savior that I that I promised. You know, last lesson, we, we saw that promise in uh, the Garden of Eden that he would send one to crush Satan's head. And so he tells Abraham, uh, it's going to be through through your family, and your descendants are, are going to become great. Uh, and, and notice here, it says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Um, because, well, one, part of that meant he'd have to have a whole bunch of descendants, and his wife was barren. Um, but then verse 19 says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. So God came to him when Abraham was 75 and, and uh, Sarah was 65, and he said, you're going to have all these descendants. And then 25 years later, well, 24 years later, he still doesn't have any kids. And God comes to him again and says, yep, you're going to have all these descendants. Um, if Abraham's just looking at the facts, at the science of it, this isn't working, right? Uh, there's no way we're having kids. There's no way this is going to happen. But God said so. So he he trusted. God had already proved himself several times telling Abraham something and then making it happen. Um, so he faced the fact, yet verse 20, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. And then Paul writes, this is why, and here he quotes Genesis, it was credited to him as righteousness. That's what God said about this. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So Paul says, just like Abraham received salvation, Abraham received these blessings because God credited it, not because Abraham earned it, but because God put it on his account. And he says, that's how it works with us. He puts what Jesus has done on our account. He credits it to us. Um, you want to read Hebrews 11, 1? Now faith, okay. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and the certain of what we do not see. Okay. Um, you know, faith is is trusting something even though 
doesn't make sense, even though we don't see it, right? Trusting in God, even though I don't see him. Uh, I can see what he's done, but uh, but yeah, that that's faith. Uh, and so then I've got the question on there, does our belief or refusal to believe change what God is? No. No. Um, you know, when you ask it like that, that's an easy answer, you know, but by me thinking that you're an alien doesn't make you an alien, right? I don't really think you're an alien, um, no matter how you look today. <laughs> I'm sure you I look might be. I might be. <laughs> but, but, you know, me thinking it about you doesn't change it. But so many people today feel that way about God. Well, I think that he's this way. You think that he's that way. And, and you know, we're both right. He's that way to you. He's this way to me. No, that's God is who God is. We don't get to change him. He changes us. And faith is trusting in who he is, not in who we want to make him. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the last part of the lesson, then the last page here, last half page, talks about the purpose or the blessings of faith. Um, God's word gives all sorts of blessings that it says we receive through faith. So what we'll do is we'll take turns reading the passage, and then I'll ask you to identify what gift or gifts you see um, given through faith in, in each of these verses. So Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what gift or gifts do you see there? Um, I guess the gift of life. Okay. You know, he said he says we've been justified through faith and that you know in the beginning of the lesson we talked about what justification means it's, it's that declared not guilty right so so we've we've got freedom right we're, we're not guilty that that life yeah and then right. he said because of that we have we have peace with god so instead mm -hmm. of uh instead of fear instead of uh, uh anxiety peace with god i don't have well, fear anxiety that? i might have i don't have fear okay yeah <laughs> i mean because if if, if we're standing before a holy and righteous, all-powerful God, that's a scary thing when we know that that we're guilty. Um, but because we're justified, um, because he's declared us not guilty, we can stand before him not afraid. Yeah, excellent. How about Romans 5.11? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation okay so what uh gifts do you see there um oh no you tell me okay you know he says through him we've received reconciliation right that uh, that uh um we were separated you know our sin separated us from god but but now we're brought back together uh, and I suppose the other one in there, you know, he says we we rejoice in God. Um, we we can celebrate. We can uh, uh, again not instead of fear at His coming, we we can rejoice knowing that He's coming to take okay. us to be with Him. Yeah. Okay. And then Romans three says this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So the gift there. Is that we have um, faith that we believe and that he's coming back. Okay. Yeah. And, and through that faith, he says we have righteousness, right? Uh, this righteousness comes through faith. And, uh, you know, righteousness is one of those Bible terms that I, I don't think, you know, sometimes we just kind of gloss it over and not really think about what it is. But but it's it's the the state of being right. Uh, of You know, if... if um, I don't know what kind of kid you were if you ever got called to the principal's office, but uh, all the time, all the time. <laughs> so, you know, when that happens, uh, you can have one of two reactions. Either it's, uh oh, uh, I wonder which thing he found out about. Right. You know, because, you know, you've done wrong. It's just just what thing is, am I going to get in trouble for this time? Uh, or if you haven't done anything wrong and you're going thinking, OK, you know, I wonder what award he's given me. Um, there's a big difference in the feeling on that walk down the hall, right? Uh, but God says that we have righteousness through faith. We have the right record of, of uh, you know, the perfection that Jesus has has accomplished 
that's on our record. And he says that that's ours through faith. Um, you know, Galatians 3.26 you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So notice he says that through faith, we are children of God. We're his sons. We're, we're you know, you, you think about uh, if I wanted to go have a conversation with uh, President Biden this afternoon and, you know, kind of tell him my thoughts on, on, you know, what his next steps should be or what, you know, how he should rule the country or how he should lead the country. Um, what do you think the chances of me getting to see him tonight if i drove to washington dc none none right um I'd, I'd have a better chance of being arrested if i tried to to get to him than than to actually see him um but if if i were hunter or you know one of his kids um uh, it's a whole different thing right? Uh, right god says that that through faith that attaches us to what jesus has done we have the relationship of, of a son um, and this isn't just the president. This is this is God, the one who's really in control. Um, Ephesians 2 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. So what, what gift do you see there? Um, or whatever sins, God is there to save us. Okay, we're saved, right? Instead of instead of heading to hell, we're heading to heaven. Um, that's a, a a wonderful gift that he gives us through faith. You want to read Ephesians three twelve? In Him and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Yeah, notice that that through faith we can approach Him with freedom and confidence. You know, not with fear and trepidation. I I uh, always use the story of when uh, I was driving my kids probably 10 years ago now, um, they were, you know, five, six, seven, uh, they're in the back seat. And, and there were two things that we were going to, I don't remember what the two things were, but there was like an hour in between and home was, you know, 25 minutes back. So rather than driving all the way home, driving all the way back out, I, after we got done with the first thing, I, I asked them, Hey, you guys want to go anywhere? Um, and I was thinking we were up in Conyers. I was thinking they'd say something like, you know, Walmart or Chuck E. Cheese or, you know, something. Um, but from the back seat, my son, hey, can we go to Disney World? Um, I'm like, well, uh, we don't really have time for that right now. But but I mean, he was he was bold to make that that request, right? He he didn't have any fear um to to just go ahead and, and ask. And and God says we can be like that with him, you know, that that boldness, the freedom and confidence to to go to him. Uh, you want to read Romans 6 14? For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Yeah, he says through, through faith, sin isn't our master. And, and instead of being under law, we're under grace. And I just think about how, how some people think about God, but how he wants us to think about him. You know, some people think about God as this angry judge that's just waiting to, to punish us. So we better be good. And, and. Rather, God would have us see him as the God who, yes, is serious about sin, but loves us so much that he sent his son for us. Um, and so we we want to do the the good things. I, I, I had a bunch of bosses, you know, I had a bunch of different jobs, put myself through school, and, and I always compare a couple of the bosses. My first real job, you know, before that I had a paper out and done lawn mowing and babysitting and all that, but but first real job, you know, punch a time clock job was at the restaurant down the street from our house. And um, the owner uh, ruled through terror, right? I mean, it, it was constant threats and, and yelling. And uh, uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, you know, people didn't work there very long. They, they quit pretty quickly. Um, but I just figured, and this is my first job, I figured this is how it is, right? You get yelled at. Um, and it was everything. You better not break that or else I'm docking it from your check and you're know, yelling at people. You know, And so I wanted to do a good job. You know, I didn't want to be late. I wanted to do things right because I didn't want to get yelled at. Um, later, I had a job at an architectural woodworking place and and Jack was the boss and you know, he's the owner of the place. And he's got probably five times more employees than, than Mary did. But um, I never once heard him yelling at anyone. Uh, you know, we were, there was a bunch of uh, seminary students that would work in the shipping department in the afternoons because our classes were in the morning and we come over there and work. 
Um, and so, I mean, we were part time, but still he came back. He talked to each one of us. He got to know us. He, he, he asked about our families, all that kind of stuff. Uh, one of my friends uh, was always having car trouble because he never really fixed it. He would, you know, take it to the mechanic and, well, I can't replace that. So just, you know, get it back running again. And finally, Jack called the mechanic and said, just do what it actually needs and I'll pay for it. You know, and didn't tell the, the guy this until he came and picked up his car, you know, so um, we, we wanted to do a good job for Jack, not because we were afraid of getting yelled at, but because we love the guy, right? Um, right. So which one is better to work for? You know, the, the one who's who's all threats or the one who, who you want to, to please because, because of love. I, I think I'd pick Jack every time. Right. Um, right. And, and that's, that's how we can view God uh, that we, we want to obey God, but, but not because we're scared of him, uh, but out of love for everything that he's done for us. Uh, much better way to live. Right. So one of the gifts that faith gives uh, and how about Romans eight thirty two. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will be not also along with him graciously give us all things. Okay. Notice, you know, if he was willing to give us his son, of course, he's going to give us all the rest. Mm -hmm. So that passage is the one that, that includes everything, right? Physical and spiritual blessings. But, but all the other passages, we're dealing with spiritual blessings, right? The the peace, the the relationship with God, the 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 forgiveness, the joy, all of that. So I asked the question there: Are there other ways, other than through faith? Are there other ways to get these gifts? Ask for them. But I mean, so so that would be through faith, right? So so uh, right. Um, but I mean, other than from God through faith, people try to to find peace or, or uh, um, righteousness or whatever outside of faith in Christ, but, but it doesn't work. You know, the writer to the Hebrew says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we can't have a good relationship with him if we're not trusting in him. Uh, and, and John 14, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, it, it's only, only through what, what he has done. Um, All right. Any questions on on faith? No. Okay. Then let's let's jump ahead to lesson four, because one, that's a little bit shorter, and two, it deals with this, this aspect of faith. So since we started talking about faith, you might as well finish it up. And three is a really long one. So so rather than breaking that one up. Um so in, in chapter four, we talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, chapter one was was uh, you know, who is God? Uh, in chapter three, which we haven't gotten to yet, uh, we talk about who is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. And now in chapter four, we deal with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And you've got that diagram on the page again, you know, the um, not really making it make sense, but uh, showing what scripture says, right? The father is God. The son is God. The spirit is God. Um, but the father is not the son. The son isn't the spirit. The spirit is not father. Um and yet, you know, there's not three gods, but but one God. Uh, so who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is true God, wow. one of the three persons of the triune God. And we we had that passage last time, you know, the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, fellowship of the Spirit. Um, in, in Acts 5, you have a, a, a passage that specifically says the Holy Spirit is God. You know, if, if you're looking at Acts 5, Peter's talking to Ananias and he says, you know, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And then a couple sentences later or a couple lines later, he says, you haven't lied to men, but to God, right? The Holy Spirit is God. So that first part is just a reminder, you know, the Holy Spirit is true God. Any questions there? Any other teachings you've heard? You know, he's not just uh, some force sent out or, or whatever, or a part of the Father, but um, but one of the three persons of the Trinity, true God. Um, questions there? No. Okay. So then the rest of the lesson deals with what the Holy Spirit does. You know, F Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all involved in all of it. But normally, you know, the Bible highlights certain work for each person of the Trinity, right? So normally when we think about the Father, um, we, we talk about him as the creator, right? He's the one who made us and the one who preserves us, right? Um, normally when we think about the son, we think about him being the redeemer, right? He's the one who came to pay our price. 
um, to, to save us. And then the spirit, the Bible normally talks about as the, the sanctifier, the one who, who makes us holy. And, and, and it talks about that in two different ways. The, the first way, by creating faith in us. And then the second way, by uh, strengthening that faith or, or, or uh, um, building that faith in us. And, and sometimes, you know, people can get confused when they're when they see one of these passages about the Holy Spirit uh, doing something for us or, or you know, how, how we play into that. Um, if we don't make the, that distinction, right, that sometimes it's talking about creating faith and sometimes it's talking about building that faith. So the first part of the lesson, we'll be talking about the passages that talk about the Holy Spirit as one who creates faith in us. And the second part of the lesson, we'll talk about the passages that talk about the one who who strengthens faith in us. Um, so what does the Holy Spirit do? He's the sanctifier. Um, but in order to understand that, we got to start with where we were at. Um, you know, what does the Bible say about us by nature? Um, well, by nature, the Bible says I'm dead in sin. You want to read Ephesians 2, 1? Oh, here we are. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Yeah, you know, dead. Uh, think of the picture of a corpse. Uh, what, what does that communicate? You know, if, if if someone is dead, what can they do? Nothing. Nothing. Right? I mean, if, if you're watching one of those uh, medical shows on TV and, and the guy's there on the on the uh, the gurney and he's hooked up to the, the leads and, and you hear the flat line, right? The beep. Um, and suddenly the guy jumps up and grabs the paddles and tells everybody to clear and, and, and charge to 300 and, and puts them on his own chest and shocks his heart to start beating again. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be watching that show much because it's not at all realistic, right? I mean, that that's not how it works. Um, you, you can't, if someone's dead, they need someone else to, to do something if that's going to change, right? Um, and mm. so when the Bible says we were dead, that's a powerful statement. That meant we couldn't do anything. We we had no power. Um, but it not only describes us spiritually that way by nature, it describes us as hostile to God. You want to read Romans 8, 7? The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Okay. Um, so even if we could do something, which we couldn't because we were dead, if we could, we'd be fighting against him. We wouldn't be coming towards him um, because that's what we are by nature. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, it talks about how by nature we think God's word is foolish. So it's not like we're going to be convinced to change our mind about it because, one, we're dead. We couldn't do anything. We're hostile. So we'd be fighting against him and, and thinking his word is foolish. But we're not going to be convinced otherwise. Um, he writes, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God for their foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. You know, if, if I were to go home today and my kids would tell me, hey, dad, you got to send all your money from your bank account into, you know, you got to send it to this, this Teletubbies website because the Teletubbies are going to take over the world. And they said that whoever sends them their money, they'll be on their side and they won't destroy them. So, so send all your money in. What do you think the chances of me sending my money into the Teletubby army Um uh, not gonna you, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to do it, right? It, because that that's foolish. And no matter how mm -hmm. much they try to convince me um, that that that's foolishness, I'm not going to be convinced. And the Bible says that's how we are towards God's word by nature. Um, a, a lot of times, as humans, we like to try to take credit for things that only God can do. When it comes to coming to faith, God makes it really clear that we were powerless, right? We were dead. Um, our, our motive wasn't there. We were hostile to God. We, we weren't wanting to come to him. And, and our, our mind, there's no way we would be convinced because by nature, we think that everything he says is foolish. In Genesis 6, you know, he, he looks at us and says only evil all the time. That's what we are by nature. Uh, and and I, I put that on there just so that when we see what the spirit does, we don't try to say, oh yeah, that was me doing it. Um, but, but no, God takes us from that to something else. So if we if we turn the page, you get the the you know statement: the Holy Spirit calls me to faith through the Word, and and we have there the example of of Saul slash Paul. So uh, um, that early uh, missionary 
uh, the Apostle Paul, who went from town to town and 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 uh, created all these Christian churches and and wrote uh, you know a good chunk of the the books of the New Testament. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit inspired him to. Uh, this is him telling his story. So he wasn't always this passionate missionary for Jesus. In fact, he was opposed to Jesus. He was a Jew from Jerusalem that thought that these Christians were messed up. You know, he had been one of them saying, you know, crucify him. He he was there um, telling them to, to put Stephen to death because he was preaching a, about a, a resurrected Jesus. And Paul said, that's crazy. Um, so this is this is him telling his story. So so after after he became a Christian and, and became this missionary, uh, he was persecuted for speaking of Christ because, again, the Jewish leaders didn't want that competition. Uh, and so they were trying to squash this message of Christianity. Uh, and so he's on trial, and uh, he was a Roman citizen, so he had appealed to Caesar. So the the, the governor of the whole area, the, the king, was, uh, um, was listening to this trial. And, and this is what he says. <laughs> he says, this is Paul speaking. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So the, the Jews were accusing him saying, you know, he's supporting this Jesus guy and that that's against our religion and, and he's causing problems. And Paul says, I was right there with you. I wanted to do everything I could to oppose him. Um, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem on the authority of the chief priests. I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. Uh, to blaspheme is to say that God isn't God. Um, and so in other words, Paul was trying to get him to say Jesus isn't God. Um, so he says, I was trying to do that in my obsession against them. I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So, I mean, he's even, he hates the name of Jesus so much that he's he's making journeys to try to find Christians and get rid of them in other cities. Uh, verse 12, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Um, the goads would have been the sharp things that would get an animal to go the direction you wanted it to go. And if you're trying to go the other way, he says that that's not going to end well, right? Um, so so Saul is knocked to the ground, clearly powerless. He's blinded. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? Um, you know, you're saying I'm persecuting you. Who, who are you? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Can you imagine that, that gulp moment? The oops, right? I, I, I thought this was craziness. And now here, I see you really are alive and powerful. But then Jesus says, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Um, so, you know, it says there, note Paul's attitude toward Christianity prior to his conversion. He, if 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 anyone was against Christianity, it was him. I mean, he was he was number one against it. God appears to him in bright light. God renders him powerless. And then you've got that question: Which statement is more accurate? A. Paul willingly chose to become a Christian, or B. Although Paul was unwilling, God brought him to faith. A. Yeah. yeah, no question, right? I mean, of course. He was fighting against it. Jesus says, nope, you're going to believe in me now. You're going to be my follower. Um, and I put this on here because normally when someone comes to faith, that's an internal thing, right? We don't see it uh, quite as obviously. Yeah, you might see some some effects, but, but uh, we can't see the heart. Um, but with Paul, he's telling us exactly where his heart was and exactly what Jesus is doing. Um, Jesus is the one that that changed him, not Paul saying, you know what, that makes some sense. Um, and, and that's how it always is. Through faith, God takes us from death to life. He changes what we were by nature. Uh, so in Ephesians 2, 1, we heard that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. You want to read Ephesians 2, 4, and 5? But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in 
mercy made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Yeah, we were dead. He made us alive. Um, and that's a gift from God, not, not our work. Um, Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Um, we didn't do it. God, God did it. And he uses tools. He uses the word. Um, faith comes from hearing the word. You want to read Romans 10, 17? Consequently, faith comes from being from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Okay. Um, you know, the the word of Christ. We 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 get faith through hearing the message. That's what the Spirit uses, right? Romans 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Um, this is the work of of the, the Holy Spirit at the top of the page in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. So if someone's got the spirit working on them, they're not going to be saying, I hate Jesus, right? Um, and no one can say Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. If someone believes that Jesus is their God, um, he says, the only way that happens is the Holy Spirit working in them. You want to read 1 Corinthians 1.30? It is because of him that you are a that you are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, he did it, right? Um, you know, so mm -hmm. so as as we look at all these passages and you look at how does someone come to faith? Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible is really clear. We didn't have the power to do it. God does it, right? God changes our hearts. You know, there's a passage that talks about how he removes our heart of stone and replaces it with the heart of flesh. Um, you know, that's what he does for us spiritually. He he takes us from being an unbeliever to a believer. Make sense? Any questions on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's the first part we talked about, where the Holy Spirit brings us to faith. We couldn't do it. It's got to be God doing it. But then once he has brought us to faith, he gives us opportunities to, to work alongside of him, right? To, to strengthen our faith. He, he gives us choices. Uh, before he brought us to faith, we had no choice to come to God because we were hostile. We just couldn't do it. But once he's brought us to faith, we have choices either to, to do things that will strengthen our faith or to do things that will harm our faith. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so every day it's, you know, will I read God's word and pray to him things that build that relationship? Or will I find one sin or another to, to put a, a barrier in that relationship? Um, and, and so the, the Holy Spirit then helps us in that battle, uh, in those choices. Uh, and so we've got, you know, the, the Holy Spirit sanctifies me or sets me apart. That's what you know, he makes me holy for a life of godly living through the gospel. So just like he uses the word to bring us to faith, he uses the word to, to strengthen our faith and to keep us in the faith. Uh, in John 17, Jesus was praying for his disciples. And he said, for those who would come after them, for us, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So, so use your word to strengthen us, to sanctify us. You want to read John 15, 5? I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay. Um, that's kind of a, a theme passage for abiding grace. You see the uh, the logo, you know, with the, the branches and the grapes, the, the fruit coming from the vine. Um we need to be connected to Jesus to accomplish good things, to accomplish that fruit. Uh, and, and that happens through the word. So the spirit uses the word to, to set us apart for that life of godly living. Uh, he, he sets us apart for a life of producing good works done in faith. Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right. So only through faith can we do the things that are actually good works. Um, you know, someone who's an unbeliever, they can do things that, to the world look like good works, but if they're not doing it out of faith, God says uh, those aren't pleasing. Um, the next one, Holy Spirit sets us apart for a life of producing good works done according to God's will. Uh, in Matthew 15, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees who, who seemed to be doing all the right things, right? They were keeping all the rules they had made. They were wearing the right things. They were saying their public prayers. They were in church all the time. They were giving their offerings. Um, they were fasting and, and all these things that, that um, all these rules that they had added to say, this is how you, you please God. 
And Jesus says about them, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Um, now instead, we, we do the works that God gives us to do. In Ephesians 2, this was right after the by grace you've been saved thing. Um, he says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So so uh, the, the works that God has for us um, that he gives us faith to accomplish. And the Holy Spirit sets us apart for a life of producing good works done to God's glory. We do it not so that everybody says, hey, look how good so-and-so is, but look how good God is. You want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31? So whatever, so whether you eat or drink or whether whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Okay. <laughs> All for God's glory. Yeah. Um, in Matthew 25, you know, Jesus says on Judgment Day, uh, when he says, look at all the good things you did to the believers, they'll say, when did we do those things for you? And he says, whatever you did for one of the least of these you're doing for me. Whatever we we do in faith is, is um, good in God's eyes. And then finally, the Holy Spirit sanctifies me for a life of fighting our sinful flesh. Hebrews 3 says, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So he's speaking to believers and he says, make sure you don't turn away from God. Make sure you don't leave. Um, do you want to read Hebrews 10, 26? If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, so truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that uh, kind of a scary passage, right? The the next yeah. verse actually goes, you know, it says no sacrifice for sins is left, but only the the fearful expectation of the raging fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I mean, so, but notice he doesn't say if we sin after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, because as humans, well, we have a sinful nature, and sometimes we we fail and we give in to the sinful nature. You know, Paul talked about that in Romans 7. You know, the good I want to do, I don't always do. The evil I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Who will rescue me from this? But then he says, thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Jesus. Um, but but notice it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning. Um, so if, if it's, you know, not just, oops, I made a mistake, but, oh, I know this is wrong. I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway. Who cares what God says? Um, deliberate. And and sometimes that happens, right? When we know something's wrong and we do it anyway, we shouldn't. Um, but sometimes we do. Uh, well, what happens then? Well, when we realize and say, oh, man, what did I do? Lord, forgive me. He forgives. You know, when, when we repent, when, when, when we are looking for his forgiveness, he is giving it. He says he's right there with it. But the problem is if we keep on deliberately sinning, if I say, I don't, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it anyway, e eventually... I'm not going to care what God says. I'm not going to be repentant. And if I'm not repentant, well, Christ's sacrifice has, has no good for me because I'm not trusting in it. I'm not looking for his forgiveness. So notice the warning. If we continue in those sins, um, mm. we're pulling ourselves further and further away from God. Any, any questions on any of that? No. Okay. Then the rest of the lesson, I've got some questions for you. Uh, first one, can faith be lost? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There are some churches that teach once saved, always saved. So they say, once you're saved, you can never fall away. But of course, God's word is really clear. It gives warnings. It tells us not to do the things that lead to us falling away. I mean, it does give promises. He says, you know, to, to us who believe, he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. He says, no one can pluck you out of my hand. Um, but... He doesn't say he forces us to stay in his hand. I mean, we can jump out. Um, and that's what those last two passages we, we read were about. Um, so yeah, faith can be lost. But God has also made promises that says when we remain in him, when we stay in his word, uh, he'll keep strengthening that faith so, so that it isn't. Um, so, okay, you got that one. How about is church attendance important? It is. Okay. Um, you know, is church attendance necessary for salvation? Well, you know, if I'm on a deserted island and I've got my Bible and I and I read and I pray and and, and God builds my faith through that, you know, sure, that could work. Um, but I'm not on a deserted island. God tells us we're, we're humans that need relationship. 
Um, we need the encouragement of others. And in the verse in Hebrews 10, 25, so right before that verse we just read, he said, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, as the world gets worse and worse, we need one another. But then he says, but if we deliberately keep on sinning, if, if we're going to keep turning away from him, then we're in trouble, right? Um, so yeah, that's important. You know, we we get the opportunity to, to worship God and, and to, to praise him. And we get the opportunity to to hear his word and receive, you know, the strength of the sacraments. Um, so yes, good. How about predestination? Have you heard that term before? No. Okay. So predestination, different people use the term in different ways. Um, some people hear the word predestination and they think like fatalism. So in other words, uh, um, well, God's got it all planned out. So it doesn't really matter what I do. He's going to do what he wants to do anyway. Um, well, that's not exactly true because God says the decisions we make have consequences, um, either for the good or, or the bad. Yes, he knows everything and, and he knows what he's going to do, but he does let us make choices. You know, like we talked about in lesson two, you know, with the tree in the in the middle of the garden, he gives us those opportunities to to either love him or or not. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, predestination is not fatalism because God says that that we have decisions and and they have they have uh, um, causality, they have consequences. Um, others talk about predestination and and they think of double predestination. So in other words, that, that God decided some people he wanted to go to hell and some people he wanted to go to heaven, uh, you know, before anyone did anything. Um, and, and that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God wanted all to be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth. Um, but he realized that some would reject and, and they had the consequences for that. Um, so when we talk about predestination, uh, it, it's not a teaching that um, is ever designed to, I mean, it, 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 it's not a warning for unbelievers, it's given as comfort for believers. Uh, you know, this is one of the, the teachings that I probably struggled with most in my life. I remember in college one time, I was talking to my RA about it, and he finally just said, well, well go back and look up every passage that says predestination or election, kind of the same same topic there. And he says, and ask yourself two questions about every time it shows up. Who is it talking to? And what's the purpose? And if you do that, you'll find that it's always talking to believers about predestination. And it's always to comfort or strengthen us. Uh, it's not to, to threaten us or warn us with, oh, maybe you aren't predestined. Um, and, and so that's uh, the uh, passage there. I'll, I'll read that one. Paul writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So every spiritual blessing we have, it comes through Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us, so pre, ahead of time, destined, decided where we were going, to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So he wanted to do this, and, and it gives him glory. It gives it, it shows his grace. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. So, you know, he predestined us, and then he gave us the payment, right? Um, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, so the Holy Spirit living in us, that gift of faith, is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So that faith then uh, tells us that, hey, we're, we're going to heaven. Um, Romans 8, 29 and 30 kind of takes all of that and condenses it into a much shorter sentence. You want to you read that one? 
For those God forsake for new, he also for this sustained to be confirmed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those he Pre-stained, he also called those he called, he also justified those he justified, he also glory God. Yeah, so notice the, the lockstep progression. He predestined us, and so that means he called us. And when, when we were born, he... Yeah, hey, you're frozen again. What's that? <laughs> what, what, what was that? I, I didn't hear what you said, sorry. Oh, you froze, that's all I said. You're frozen oh, again. <laughs> okay, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. So yeah, notice the lockstep progression, right? He he predestined us and then he he called us. So he he you know brought us to faith through his word. Uh those he called, he justified. Remember, that's that not guilty verdict. He gave us faith, which mm -hmm. means our sins are forgiven. And those he justified, he glorified, right? We have heaven waiting for us. Um my wife wife up. what's that? I think my wife is messing up. You keep freezing. Okay. You want me to do the audio on the phone? Or should we no, try you're fine. Okay, we're you're good fine. now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so any questions on predestination? No. Okay. So then let's let's actually skip down to the last question because that that goes with this um a little bit. So uh uh why do some believe and not others? Um what what do you think? How, how would you answer that one? A lot of some believe and not others, because a lot of people have a mentality of uh, if you can see it, it's believable. If you don't see it, you can't believe it. It's not true. Okay. Yeah, I got I got to see it to believe it. Um, mm -hmm. Here. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw a little diagram here. Can you see that uh, that whiteboard? I can. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, you know, basically, there are are two kinds of people in the world. Um, You've got believers and unbelievers. Mm -hmm. And you know, you said you said the people who who don't believe, it's because, well, I haven't seen it. I'm not going to believe it unless I unless I see it, unless I have proof. Um, so if they don't believe, whose fault is it? Okay. Mm. Usually they're own. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, the Bible's really clear about that. You know, it, it's uh, if someone doesn't believe it, it's it's human fault. You know, uh, um, passages on there, Ezekiel 33, God says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? So so he's saying, I want you, but, but you're rejecting me, right? Um, Matthew 23, that's Jesus. You know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you weren't willing. Right? Jesus wanted them, but but they're rejecting. So so if someone doesn't believe, it's it's their own fault. Um, mm -hmm. If someone believes, who gets the credit there? God. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, by nature we were hostile. By nature we were dead. God has to do it. Yeah. Now, logically. This doesn't seem to line up, right? Because if if God gets the credit, you know, if we couldn't do it and God gets the credit for someone who believes, logically, wouldn't it make sense that if someone doesn't believe, it's it's God's fault? Um, no. I mean, I mean, logically, that's that's what uh, uh, our human mind would say. Uh, and actually, there are some that teach that, and that's where that double predestination comes in that I, I talked about before and my handwriting's awful. I apologize for that. Oh, um, no, you they, say, <laughs> they say, you know, so this is true. So this must be true. But God says, no, I, I don't want people to, to die. I, um, they reject it. Right. And so, so then some people look at that and say, okay, yeah, the Bible's really clear. If someone doesn't believe it's their own fault. So that must mean that if someone believes, um, well, then they should get the credit. And that's where, that's where the teaching of decision theology comes in. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that, where they talk about, you know, you got to take the first step. You have to invite Jesus into your heart. And then after that, he he blesses you. But of course, the Bible says we're not able to do that because by nature, we're hostile. We, we're dead, all of that. So, you know, double predestination doesn't agree with scripture. Decision theology doesn't agree with scripture. But what does scripture say? 
Well, it's because of him that we're in Christ Jesus. Uh, and if we're not, that's our own fault. Mm -hmm. So logically, this doesn't make sense, but this is what God's word says. Um, and so those other teachings, double predestination, decision theology, they don't agree with God's word. So even, even if they might make sense to, to your mind, um, God says something else. And so I always want to go with what God says because, yeah, I might not understand everything about it. But again, if I could understand everything about God, he wouldn't be that much of a God. Um, any questions on that? No. Okay. All right. Awesome. Uh, so then there's just that one question that we skipped. Do I have to feel saved to be saved? How would you answer that one? Do I have to feel saved to be saved? I'd say no. Okay. You know, our salvation isn't based on our emotions. Because our emotions are up and down all over the place, right? Um, our salvation is based on the truth of what God has done for us. And, and trust in that, right? I mean, in, in 1 John 3... John writes, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. In, in that section, John had been talking about how, you know, sometimes we feel down, um, you know, and, and are uncertain. Um, and he says, well, when that happens, go back to the facts, right? We believe that that we're supposed to be perfect and we failed. We believe that Jesus came and, and forgave all of our sins and gives us his perfection. And, and whoever believes in him has eternal life. So when your hearts condemn you, remember God's promises because God's greater than our hearts. Um, there are some churches that that make the relationship with God all about the emotion. And so, I mean, they design a worship style that's designed to get people all psyched up and pumped up. So, I mean, they, I, I've heard worship planners talk about, well, you got to have this kind of music and then that kind of music. And then, you know, you get them all riled up and and, and pressure them to to make their decision for Christ. And, and you know, this is how, it, you know, the, the name of Methodism, Methodist, you know, that, that comes from that concept that, it's all about the emotions. Um, now, today's Methodists have aren't, there's not a lot of consistency in what, what's being taught between the different Methodist churches. So, so they might not all be right there anymore. But I mean, that's where the name of the church body comes from, that idea that, that our emotions um, kind of drive that salvation instead of God's truth and the Holy Spirit working in our heart. That's what drives that's where we have confidence and comfort. And so when, when our emotions are up or down, um, we can have comfort knowing that that we're gods. Now, when we know that we're gods and, and we know that he's in control, that that does give us good emotions. Um, and so we we celebrate those emotions, but we don't trust in them. You know, the, the two passages there, Galatians 5, he talks about the fruit of the spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, you know, that those are good things that come from a relationship with God or, or Romans 15. He says, may the, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy spirit. Um, so it's, it's all about, uh, yeah, we, because of what God has done, because we have faith, well then, then we can have those good feelings too, but we don't, we don't rely on the feelings we rely on, on God. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, because uh, I don't have anything. <laughs> what's that? I said, yeah, they wouldn't work with me. I don't have emotions much. <laughs> okay. Well, good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so any questions? That's chapter four. No. All right. Awesome. So then next Wednesday, Vicki said she'll be she'll be back. Um, and so we'll do lesson five because uh, uh, that was one that we had. Um, okay. well, that's, that's the next one. Yep. Okay. All right. And if do you want to get together and or maybe give Vicar a chance to to teach and, and do lesson three with you just to get you caught up? Um I kind of got a lot to do. My nephew keeps calling in for one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Of, I mean, I mean we can plan it in the future sometime, but uh maybe um, next okay. Wednesday we'll look at a calendar and, and have him schedule that. Okay, no problem. Okay, awesome. Thanks. God's blessings. Oh, we gotta close yep. with prayer. I'll I'll, I'll right, prayer here quick. Lord God, thank you for giving us the gift of faith and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, bless us that we live in the joy that that brings. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.